Let's check the latest news update with Aparna Watts. Namaskar. Welcome to Friends World TV. This is Aparna Watts and uh, here are the headlines. Sheikh Hasina in India. Amid some challenges celebrating a special friendship, Democrats answered Trump's ire, name-calling with subpoenas. ASX tumbled $74 billion in two days over global recession fears here in Australia. Alaska's northern fur seals find refuge on tip of volcano. Virat Kohli keeps dressing room door open for Rohit Sharma in a special gesture. Bangladesh and India's bilateral ties have rarely been a linear affair. That is why Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's visit to India beginning October 3 is a much-anticipated political event. There is little doubt that when India assisted Bangladesh to attain independence in 1971, many believed that, that Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and Mrs. Indira Gandhi would forge a partnership rooted in progressive ideals and a common vision for their nations in South Asia and the world, one that would last for generations. The assassination of Mujib and most of his family members in 1975, which resurrected the political, Islamic and military leaders from the political right between 1975 and 1996, meant that Bangladesh could not structure any lasting partnership with India. Its relationship with India reached an all-time low when the BNP and jamaat e islami coalition government between 2001 and 2006 allowed Bangladeshi ter territory to host insurgent activities against the northeastern states of India. This un unfortunate nosedive in the Bangladesh-India relationship was decisively reversed after the electoral victory of the Awami League and Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina in December 2008. There is little disagreement today that Bangladesh-India ties have greatly benefited since then. That is why, since 2009, Bangladesh and India have peacefully navigated many contested issues that had remained unresolved since 1947. In 2015, the Indian government led by the BJP ratified the 19, 1974 Land Boundary Treaty, which ex executed a land swap of enclaves, settling historical anomalies dating back to the partition of the subcontinent. Bangladesh and India also peacefully obtained an international court ruling that allowed the two nations to explore resources in the Bay of Bengal without stepping on each other's toes. These milestones show that a partnership based on trust and a willingness to engage on equal terms can help sovereign nations resolve historical disagreements. The upcoming trip of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina can be viewed as an effort to reinvest in the special friendship that Bangladesh and India have developed during her premiership. It will likely touch on a wide range of issues that will require improvisation and cooperation from both governments to find new solutions to old problems. Specifically, Prime Minister Hasina is likely to request New Delhi's cooperation for an improved management of all rivers that Bangladesh and India share, so that a better framework is created to ensure their equitable distribution. The pending dispute over the Tista River has shown how difficult it is for India's central government to offer amicable solutions on such matters. Finalization of an efficient and mutually acceptable river management framework will test imaginations and capacities of the governments on both sides. Dhaka is also likely to seek New Delhi's cooperation in upgrading its railways, roads and shipping infrastructure and might ask for the export of more electricity to Bangladesh. As of 2017, India had extended three lines of credit worth approximately $7.4 billion. However, the execution of projects under these credit pipelines has been very slow. Less than 10% of the cumulative commitments have been dispersed so far, while almost no money from the third line of credit promising $4.5 billion has been utilized. Dhaka might seek both prompt disbursements of the existing commitments and perhaps an additional line of credit to finance infrastructure infrastructure projects in the pipeline. On the whole, Prime Minister Hasina's visit will underline and nurture the special friendship between Dhaka and New Delhi in a world where building walls and distracting and, distru and distrusting neighbours, I beg your pardon, have become the international norm. Prime Ministers Hasina and Modi are likely to demonstrate that forward-looking partnerships on equal terms are possible 
when bilateral ties are rooted in trust and a common vision of peace and economic progress. Agitated and angry, President Donald Trump squared off against House Democrats, packing his increasingly aggressive impeachment defense with name-calling and expletives. Quietly, but just as resolutely, resolutely, I beg your pardon, lawmakers expanded their inquiry, promising a broad new subpoena for documents and witnesses. You think I need a glass of water. Democratic leaders put the White House on notice that the wide-ranging subpoena would be coming for information about Trump's actions in the Ukraine controversy, the latest move in an impeachment probe that's testing the Constitution's system of checks and balances. They said they would be going to court if necessary. Amid the legal skirmishing, Wednesday was a day of verbal fireworks. The president complained that House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was hand handing out subpoenas like cookies, ra railed against a government whistleblower as vicious and assailed, and assailed the news media as corrupt and the enemy. <clears throat> All that alongside a presidential tweet storm punctuated with an accusation that congressional Democrats waste time and money. Pelosi said Democrats had no choice but to take on the most solemn of constitutional rep responsibilities to put a check on executive power after the national security whistleblowers complaint that recently came to light. The administration and Congress are on a collision course unseen in a generation after the whistleblower exposed a July phone call the president had with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, in which Trump pressed for an investigation of Democratic political rival Joe Biden and his family. We take this to be a very sad time for the American people and, and the country, Pelosi said. Impeaching the president isn't anything to be joyful about. Standing beside her, Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff accused Trump of an incitement to violence with his attacks on the unnamed whistleblower who is providing anonymity and other protections under federal laws. He said the investigation is proceeding deliberately but also with a sense of urgency. The new subpoena, coming Friday from House Oversight and Reform Chairman Elijah Cummings will be directed towards Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney and requests 13 separate batches of documents concerning the July call and related matters. The call came against the backdrop of a $250 million foreign aid package for Ukraine that was being readied by Congress but stalled by Trump. The whistleblower alleged in August that the White House tried to lock down Trump's July 25 phone call with the new Ukrainian president because it was worried about the contents being leaked to the public. The acting director of national intelligence eventually made the complaint public. In recent days, it has been disclosed that the administration similarly tried to restrict information about Trump's calls with other foreign leaders, including Russia's Vladimir Putin and Saudi Arabia's Mohammed bin Salman, by moving memos onto a highly classified computer system. In Russia, Putin said scrutiny over the phone call showed that Trump's adversaries are using every excuse to attack him. Boris Johnson will test his new Brexit plan on Thursday in the UK Parliament. Optimistic he's got enough support from hardline Euro, Euro skeptics to finally get a deal over the line. With just 28 days to go before Brexit Day, Johnson made a clear signal Wednesday he's ready to do a deal, unveiling a compromise with enough concessions to keep the European Union at the table. Within hours, Johnson's de facto deputy, Michael Gove, appeared confident of a pretty solid majority in Westminster behind the proposal. Speaking to ITV's Robert Peston show, he said there's, there's a very good chance of the deal getting through the UK Parliament. The UK is due to exit the EU on October 31, and Johnson says he will never agree to delaying Brexit beyond that point. Even if it means leaving without a deal, risking disruption at ports, to business supply chains and to the security of food, fuel and water supplies. More than three years after Britain voted to leave the bloc, Johnson says most people just want Brexit done. 
and so do we. On Wednesday, he threatened to walk away from the talks if the EU didn't agree with his plan to avoid the written, avoid, I beg your pardon, avoid the return of a hard border on the island of Ireland, what he described as essentially a technical issue. Johnson is hoping he can succeed in getting a deal through Parliament where his predecessor, Theresa May, failed three times. On Thursday, he will present the plan to his cabinet. Then either he or Brexit Secretary Steve Barclay will then take questions on it in Parliament. His proposal is to ditch the contentious backstop arrangement for the Irish border in May's deal and replace it with a regulatory border in the Irish Sea. Effectively splitting Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK, that's something May said no Prime Minister could ever accept and that the most ardent Brexiteers in Parliament refused to back until now. This time, Steve Baker, chairman of the pro-Brexit European Research Group of Conservatives MPs, gave a broad welcome to the proposals while Northern Ireland's Democratic Unionist Party, who have been propping up the Conservatives in government, also supported the proposal to replace the backstop. While the EU welcomed some of the concessions in the UK proposal, in particular the pledge to make Northern Ireland follow EU rules for goods, food and livestock, the bloc is clear that the proposal is very far from acceptable in other areas, most notably on dividing the island into two separate customs zones and giving the Northern Ireland Assembly in Belfast the power of veto. Although Johnson insisted there would be no physical checks at the land border, it would require customs checks to take place somewhere. Australian shares have closed sharply lower, posting their worst fall since August due to rising fears of a global recession. The ASX 200 dropped 2.2% to end at 6,493 points, a slight recovery compared to its earlier trading losses of minus 2.5%. It has, however, plunged by 3.7% in two days following yesterday's losses. In dollar terms, the local share market lost around $74 billion in value over two trading sessions. Investor sentiment has also dipped across the Asia-Pacific, with Tokyo's Nikkei at minus 2% and Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index, index at minus 0.6%, experiencing moderate to heavy losses. The Australian dollar is buying 67.1 US cents, around its lowest values in a decade. We are mapping out a very similar pattern to October last year. Sharp fall, slow rise, sharp fall, slow rise, stockbroker and author of Marcus Today newsletter, Marcus Padley said. The evidence for our deepest fear, global recession, has been building over the past few weeks and that kicked up again with the US ISM manufacturing numbers and then some more poor private sector employment data last night. I wouldn't be making any brave calls until we see the US, until we see the key US jobs figures on Friday and I doubt they are going to help us much. He added, it appears the ongoing China trade war is starting to hurt America's economy, which has begun to show signs of faltering. Adding to trade concerns, the U.S. will impose 7.5 billion U.S. dollars worth of tariffs on European Union imports in two weeks. This was after the World Trade Organization ruled that the EU had been granting illegal subsidies to Airbus to give it an unfair competitive advantage over Boeing. Investors also reacted poorly to pessimistic data from the European Union, revealing that factory activity had contracted to a seven-year low. Alaska's northern fur seal population for three decades has been classified as depleted. But the marine mammals are showing up in growing numbers at an unlikely location, a tiny island that forms the tip of an active undersea volcano. Vents on Bogoslov Island continue to spew mud, steam and sulfurous gases two years after an eruption sent ash clouds into the path of jetliners passing over the Bering Sea. Still, northern fur seals moms find the remote island's rocky beaches perfect for giving birth and mothering pups. The population growth of northern fur seals on Bogoslov has been extraordinary, said Tom Gellert, who leads a NOAA fisheries group that studies northern fur seals. Federal scientists visited the island in August. 
Eruptions in 2016 and 2017 showered the landscape with rocks and killed all vegetation. They also shrank and grew the island. Explosions destroyed acres of Bogoslav only to have fragmented material blown from lava vents create new real estate. The island remains about 0.5 square miles or 1.2 square kilometers. Bogoslav is surrounded by deep water and its seals eat squid and northern smooth tongue, a deep water fish that looks like a smelt. Seals on St. Paul, the largest of the Prilibov Islands, forage, uh, forage on the shallow continental shelf for walleye pollock, a fish target, targeted by commercial fishermen. Females with pups on Bogoslav return from foraging faster than Prilibov mothers, possibly allowing their pups to receive more meals and wean at a larger size, Gellert said. Bogoslav also is closer to winter feeding grounds sou south of the Aleutians, possibly allowing pups to reach the grounds with less risk from Bering Sea storms. Northern fur seals are distinct from harbor ringed, bearded, ribbon and spotted seals in Alaska, which have no ear flaps. Northern fur seals, like sea lions, are eared seals. They are named for their concentrated fur. Fur seals have 350,000 hair per square inch. Debut test opener Rohit Sharma was out for 176 and Mayank Agarwal added to the scoring flurry with his maiden test century as a relentless India dominated South Africa in the first cricket test. Both Rohit and Mayank have steered India towards a mammoth total on day two and when Rohit was walking towards the dressing room, skipper Virat Kohli was there to receive his opener with claps. The skipper's gesture was to acknowledge Rohit's contribution and his conviction to prove his critics wrong. Rohit played a stylish innings of 176 runs of 244 balls. He smashed 23 fours and six sixes with a strike rate of 72.13. Virat Kohli not only came to the dressing room gate but also patted Rohit Sharma on the back and then closed the gate. Team's head coach Ravi Shastri, batting coach Vikram Rathor and bowling coach Bharat Arun were also there to appreciate Rohit Sharma's knock. Besides Rohit and Agarwal, other Indian opening pairs to share a 300-plus partnership in Test cricket are Vinu Mankad and Pankaj Roy, 413 runs against New Zealand in 1956, and Virin Sehwag and Rahul Dravid with 410 runs against Pakistan in 206. That brings us to the end of the news. I'll be back next week with more. Namaskar.